the room, the great meals I've gotten to enjoy with your pastor. You're always so well treated when you come to the Heritage Baptist Church. And thank you for being here. How many of you have been here every single night of this meeting? That is terrific. How many have been here every night but one? That'd be the rest of you. So good. We are glad you're here. Open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 15. We'll look at a verse in chapter 15 or two. Uh, you can stand if you want to, but I'm not going to read for a little bit. So <laughs> you do whatever you'd like. It's all right. I uh, always am so kindly treated when I'm here. A, a lady last night said she remembered I'd been having voice troubles. Last year was having really bad voice troubles. I had a nodule on my vocal cords and had been prescribed a CPAP machine. So I've been sleeping with that deal on my nose. I don't have the full mask, just what they call a nasal pillow from about that time, a little before that on. And thank the Lord for the blessing. It's improving. It's not 100%, but it's way better than it was. And this lady remembered that, and she had some special lozenges for me. But I knew this was California, and I wasn't sure if they'd have marijuana in them or not. <laughs> so I asked Brother Justin to look at them. I don't know. He smelled them, then he ate them all at once. So... I, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I, I was thinking, too, I, I try to keep my eyes closed during prayer. But last night, while we were getting prayer for the offering, the platform just started moving. I mean, it was really moving. And I thought, this is San Francisco. Is this an earthquake? And so I peeked a little. It was the group of people coming up to sing for the special. And then tonight in the opening prayer, it started moving again. And I said, there must be another group coming. It was just Brother AJ. And <laughs> so I, I will try not to peek for the rest of the time as I pray. Asa is a remarkable character in the Bible. His father, Abijah, is a bad king, was king of Judah for three years. His grandfather, Rehoboam, was the son of Solomon, the one to whom the Proverbs were written. But under his leadership, if you want to call it that, the kingdom was divided and he lost 10 of the 12 tribes. 10 tribes of, of the northern kingdom separated, eventually settled on a capital of Samaria, called themselves Israel. The two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, called themselves Judah and kept the capital of Jerusalem. But when Asa came to the throne, he immediately started seeking God. Chapter 14, verse 2, he did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Took away the altars of the strange gods, the high places, break down the images, cut down the groves. And these three chapters about Asa in 2 Chronicles are fascinating. We're going to have a little overview of the first couple of chapters tonight, the Lord willing. But I want you to read with me in chapter 15. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you. Well, I'm glad the preacher likes that. The Lord is with you. 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 <laughs> That's pretty good news. And then it says, While ye be with him. Uh oh. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. You won't lose your salvation, but you'll lose the blessing of God and the enjoyment of his presence. Now, for a long season, Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. And when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times, there was no peace to him that went out nor to him that came in. But great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries and nation was destroyed of nation and city of city for God did vex them with all adversity. And here is the message of Azariah, the son of Oded to Asa, the king of Judah. Be ye strong, therefore. Let not your hands be weak for your work shall be rewarded. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd Empower me by your spirit and direct me to say what would help this church in the beginning of this year as they, by faith, believing you, go forward. And help each member of this great congregation to be strong, strong in you and in the power of your might. Strong in their walk with you, strong in their stand for you, strong in their stewardship, strong in their soul winning, strong in their separation from the world. 
strong in their testimony at work, strong in their lives before their own family. And make this time, I pray, at least a little help toward that end. Bind the devil and his demons and keep them from interfering with the seed of your word being sown in the soil of our hearts. Bless the preaching, bless the invitation. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our theme at First Baptist in Bridgeport this year is be strong. It's all through the Bible. God told Joshua that at the beginning of the book of Joshua, <clears throat> later on in the book of Joshua. Uh, we're told that in the New Testament, be strong, quit you like men. Uh, we, we find that again and again in the word of God. And I find it really, really interesting because we are living in a day when all the experts tell us that the church needs to soften up. You can't have direct confrontational preaching because after all, people have fragile psyches and if you tell them they're sinners, that might just make them really nervous. Well. <laughs> and you can't expect people to come back on Sunday night and to come an hour before church for Sunday school and you can't expect them to come back in the midweek service and sure can't expect them to come back and hear some bald-headed bozo from Bridgeport, Michigan preach to them on a Monday and Tuesday night. You got to ease up. You got to make sure your music is like their music. A lot of churches are cutting out their evening services and a lot of Christians are deciding that they don't really need to be so distinct from the world and a lot of preachers are mimicking the words of the world and the conversation of the culture in their preaching and trying to say things that worldly people will find that they relate with and, and use words but sometimes vulgar words that they think uh, uh, will make them connect with the ungodly and the unsaved but I want to tell you something in 2018 in the United States of America, God is not looking for snowflakes. He's looking for soldiers. This is no time for those sip cocktails on Saturdays and go to church on Sundays, uh, change your Bible every month or so, bail out of the evening service, conform to the culture, keep quiet about your Christian faith in the workplace, be careful not to offend anybody, uh, act as much like the world as you can and still pretend you're saved kind of Christians. No, 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 this is a time for us to be strong. I mentioned this to the preacher, you thought it'd be good if I shared it with you tonight. There's a, an interesting movement coming on and it's telling us that uh, we maybe don't have to believe all the things we've ever believed. I, I read a young man who grew up in a church like this. And I preached in a church he has. He's a nice young man. I personally like the young man. But uh, he said in his, his uh, little thing that I read, he said, at this time... I have no interest in, at this point in my ministry, I have no interest in joining the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention had a vote a while back on whether or not they should allow liquor. We never voted on that at our church of years. That's pretty clear in the word of God. You don't vote on the Bible. You just obey the Bible. They've had a debate on whether or not there should be women preachers or not. I'm sorry. The, the Bible, uh, I had a lady come to our church one night, and I didn't say anything about it, but she called me up the next Monday morning, and she said, I have a question. She said, I could just tell you're against women preachers, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, then I have a problem because God has called me to preach. I said, well, then I'd recommend you get yourself a wife. She said, What? I said, get yourself a wife. See, what are you talking about? I said, the Bible says, you want to be a bishop, a preacher, you got to be the husband of one wife, so go get yourself a wife. She didn't like me. I didn't care. And he said, at this point, I am majority text, which allows me to use the King James and the New King James, and he named some other translations. Now, what I found was interesting about those statements were the, were the words, at this time, at this point in my ministry. You know, there's some things that are going to be true forever. Yeah, come on. I, I said, that's like saying, at this point in my life, I have no interest in leaving my wife. <laughs> well, what does that mean? <laughs> it means she better behave. <laughs> 
means I may change my mind tomorrow. No, no. I, I, I was King James when I was a little boy. I was King James when I went to college. I was King James when I graduated. I was King James when I was an assistant pastor. I was King James when I became a preacher. I was King James in my 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and now in my 60s. And by the grace of God, I'll be using this Bible when I'm 70, if I live that long, 80 and 90, until I die, because this is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. No, no, no. You don't need to change it. You don't need to adjust it. You don't need to apologize for using it. You don't need to worry about some pseudo scholar who thinks that you are a little uh, unsophisticated because you use the old book. You need to be strong in the word of God and in your stand for Christ. So I want to explain a little something to you just as a prelude to the two hour message. Hmm. That's very kind, but I, you don't believe that. <laughs> So I want to get four gentlemen to help me. And uh, anybody, Brother Wong, why don't you stand right over there. Stand right by that, that little uh, bar that delineates the <laughs> angle of the curtain, okay? There you go. Stand right there. That's good. And uh, what's your name, sir? Carmen. Carmen? <laughs> Gar Garwin. Okay, Garwin, stand right by the next pole, would you please? That's good. You know, we didn't even practice, and he got his name right the first time. <laughs> Took me two times to get it right, but he got it right right away. And uh, let's say, Brother Justin, would you stand right there? And Brother Art, would you stand over there? Now, we're going to let these guys represent different theological positions. In the old days, there was only two positions, basically, believers and unbelievers. My dad was a young man going into the ministry. There's, there's people like Brother Wong, and he, we're going to call him a fundamentalist. Amen. He's not, but just pretend, all right? <laughs> now, the word that characterizes a fundamentalist is the word belief. Fundamentalist believes the Bible. It, fundamentalism came into being in about the 1800s. There was a movement called German rationalism, and they said there's no God and there's no heaven and there's no hell, and the Bible is just a book of man's writings. And that movement made its way into the universities and then into some of the students who became pastors. And they started saying that stuff in churches. And people said, whoa, wait a minute. You're not a man of God if you don't believe the Bible's the word of God. So the question came, what do you have to believe to be an Orthodox Christian? And they came up with five fundamentals of the faith. Now, the word fundamental means essential to operation. On your car, there's some things that are fundamental. The motor. No motor, no motion. Okay. The steering wheel. It'll go without a steering wheel, but not where you want it to. All right. Uh, there are some other things that are helpful, useful, important, but they're not fundamental. The turn signals. You can drive a car without turn signals. When I was a boy, uh, they actually had hand signals that you could use. You could open the window, and uh, this one meant stop, and that one meant left, and that one right, or vice versa. I think maybe that was stop, and that was left. And they were it was actually hand signals. Now. Here are the fundamentals of the faith. You know them, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the blood atonement, the inspiration of scripture, the deity of Christ. If you doubt any of those things, don't believe in those things, you cannot be a child of God, you cannot be an Orthodox Christian. Now, at that time, fundamentalists were also called evangelicals. The words meant the same thing. Then there were the liberals. They didn't believe the Bible. They didn't believe there was a God. They didn't believe in Jesus. They thought man was all there is. Humanism evolves out of that idea. There is no deity. Man must save himself. And so Brother Art is going to represent a liberal. <laughs> I'm doing better in my typecasting, I think, a little bit here. And the word that characterizes the liberal is the word unbelief. So over here, Brother Wong is a fundamentalist and uh, and brother art is a liberal and a fundamentalist characterized by the word belief fundamentalist characterized by the word belief and a liberal by the word unbelief now here's what happened these guys that were part of the german rationalistic movement and got into the churches they were getting fired they were in trouble so they started using our terms and assigning to them their meanings they would say, the Bible becomes the word of God as it speaks to you. This Bible contains the word of God. 
No, it doesn't contain the Word of God. My briefcase contains the Bible and the Weekly Standard and some note paper and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but my briefcase is not the Bible. This is the Word of God. Jesus is a son of God as we are all sons of God. No, Jesus is the only begotten son of God. He's God in the flesh. I believe they would say in the resurrection of Jesus, it is a spiritual resurrection as the flowers bloom in the spring. And the little blades of grass force their way through the dirt after the winter's snow. No, 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 no. Jesus was dead. His body was in a grave and God raised him from the dead. So uh, Brother Justin is going to represent a neo-Orthodox. Neo means new, orthodox means a believer, but he's a new kind of believer who's really not a believer. He just talks like a believer. He used the same words, but doesn't mean the same thing. And the term to characterize him is the term unbelief disguised. So he's neo-orthodox, and the term that characterizes him, say with me, is unbelief disguised. Many of your mainline denominations are like that. You're going and they'll talk kind of religious, but they don't really believe you can be born again by believing in the Lord Jesus and know that you have eternal life in heaven. The 1940s, a movement came along. It was spearheaded by a man named Harold Akengay. And Harold Akengay said, we need a new evangelicalism. Now, the Bible teaches that you should be separate from the world. Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and I'll be a father to you. You should be my sons and daughters. That's the Bible. But they said, how are we going to reach those people if we don't ever fellowship with them? I have an idea. Why don't you knock on the door and give them the gospel? <clears throat> but they exchanged the Bible principle of separation for their own idea of infiltration. And the term that they called themselves new evangelicals. Sometimes they were called the intellectual fundamentalists. And they said, we want to have meetings with these guys and we want to go to the same places they go and we want to engage them in debate and we want to be accepted by the scholarly people that are on this side because that way we can pull them over to our side. When they started, all the new evangelicals believed everything the fundamentalists believed. Believed about the Bible, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, all. But do you know what happened over time? Roy Thompson, pastor at Cleveland Baptist Church, founding pastor, and for a long time never had a Christian school. He said, I want my kids in the public schools to be witnesses and win people to Christ. And you know what he said? He said, for 20 years I put my canaries in the cage with the sparrows to teach the sparrows how to sing. And when it was all done, I had no singing sparrows, but I had a whole bunch of canaries that would only chirp. Here's the Bible principle, Haggai. Ask the priest, if he has holy flesh in his garment and he touches something that's unholy, does touching the unholy with the holy make it holy? No. But does touching the unholy to the holy make the holy unholy? Yes. You don't catch good health. If I have a cold and Pastor Justin doesn't and he coughs on me, I will not get better. But if I cold and he doesn't, I cough on him, he may get sick. That's why the Bible doesn't teach infiltration. The Bible teaches separation. And the entire movement of new evangelicalism has been a colossal failure. Now there are new evangelicals who don't believe the Bible is infallible. One of their own, Harold Linzel, wrote a book. You can look it up. He wrote it back in the 70s called The Battle for the Bible. Another of theirs, Francis Schaeffer, wrote a book called The Great Evangelical Divide because he's worried about people doubting the authenticity and, and veracity of the Word of God. And so we are not new evangelicals. We're fundamentalists. We don't believe in infiltration. We believe in separation. We're not going to have Good Friday services with the people who don't believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. We're not going to yoke up with some unbelievers to have some kind of a mass meeting and get a bunch of people to hear a watered-down version of the gospel. No, we're going to obey the Bible. Uh, we're not infiltrators. We're separators. But here's what's happening. Some of these guys over here, young men, are saying, you know what? We know those guys are bad. We know those guys are bad. 
But those guys, some of them are all right. Why don't we hang around the people who hang around the bad people? Why don't we have some of them in our church? Why don't we hang around with the compromisers? And you can watch it happen. They give away one thing and another thing and another thing and another thing and another thing. And there's no telling where they end up. Listen to me. If you cut the rope that holds you to the anchor of truth, you have no control over where the ship of your life is going to be taken by the currents and the winds of change and circumstance that are all around you. No, no, no. We got a book. It's the word of God. You hang on to the book and the Bible says be strong my successor co-pastor now Pastor Howell called me this afternoon I referenced a survey that was done some years ago by a man of young fundamentalists and most of them had gone to colleges that did not take a King James Bible position 7% of them believed that there was another way to heaven than the Lord Jesus for people who never heard the name of Jesus 13% believed that there was not literal fire in hell and that there might be some kind of other thing. And I could go on and on with all the issues that they had. Now, you know why that was? Because about 85% of those young people went to a college that didn't take the right position on the Bible. You don't have an infallible Bible. You can change everything. And that man started another church, and now he has said that he's going to be involved in a nonprofit organization. He won't be preaching as much. And some of the staff, uh, and ready, some of the women teachers will be preaching in his place. What happened? Here, 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 here. And I'm glad your preachers are rock solid, Bible believing, independent, fundamental, soul winning, separated, King James Baptist. God's message to Asa is a needed message for us today. And he comes to us and he says, be strong. The term that the new evangelicals are characterized by is the term belief compromised. So one more time, you have a fundamentalist, the term characterizes him as belief. You have a liberal characterized by the term unbelief. You have a new or orthodox characterized by the term unbelief disguised. And a new evangelical characterized by the term belief compromised. So give these fellows a hand. They did a great job. We didn't practice but for an hour. And uh, see, uh, see the preacher later. He'll give you all $20, maybe. <laughs> so I want you to see some lessons from the life of Asa as we think, think about this matter of being strong. At the very beginning of his life, his ministry, his reign, not his life, but his reign as king, The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 14, Abijah slept with his fathers. They buried him in the city of David. Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. In his days, the land was quiet. Ten years, Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. And he took away all the cities of Judah, the high places and images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. Principle number one, confession and cleansing precede blessing and building. What did he do? He said, God, I'm not going to be like my daddy was. My daddy didn't love me. My daddy didn't trust you. My daddy didn't serve you. He'd call on you when he got in trouble sometimes. But my daddy wasn't committed to you. Lord, I want to do what is good and right in your eyes. And he said, boy, if I'm going to be good and right in your eyes, I'm going to have to get rid of some of these false gods. Can I say to the Heritage Baptist Church that this church will be no stronger than the members? And we will be no stronger than our individual walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I call on you as a body to seek the Lord to be in your Bible, to be in your prayer closet, to allow the Spirit of God to show you the things that are in your life and in your mind and in your houses that draw you away from the Lord Jesus Christ and to be willing at any time to get rid of anything that interferes with your walk with Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says the land was quiet. They had peace, confession, cleansing, precede blessing and building. But look what it says when the land is quiet in verse six. And he built fenced cities in Judah for the land had rest and he had no war. How about that? Because the Lord had given him rest. Now, what did he do in a time of peace? Well, he cut the defense budget. He said, everything's pretty good. We don't have to run so many buses. He said, the church is strong. We won't go out and knock on as many doors. We'll kind of take it easy a little bit. The chairman of the pulpit committee of the 
Temple of the Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, called me. He asked me if after J. Don Jennings had resigned as the pastor, the successor to Lee Robertson, they might consider my name as a possible candidate at that church. And here's what he said. He said, you know, Dr. Robertson was all about soul winning and building and getting more buildings. And he said he was there for 40 years and the people were tired. And they wanted something for themselves. They wanted to be fed. Now, I think you ought to be fed from the Word of God, and your preacher preaches the Bible, and he gives you great truth and great help. But the Word of God isn't just for you to sit down and enjoy. It is a marching order for the child of God to act upon. I said that last night, and any sermon that doesn't challenge you to do something is not Bible preaching. The word preach in the New Testament is the Greek word keru, and it means the King's Herald. And when the King's Herald came out, he didn't just give you a nice little announcement. He always told you to do something. Bible preaching always leads you to a point of decision. It doesn't say, here's the truth, isn't it nice? It says, here's the truth. Now, what are you going to do about it? And what Asa said is, when things are good, we better get stronger. Preacher, how many unpaid bills do you have here at your church? Unpaid bills. Like bills that you, you, they were due, but you couldn't pay them. Oh, well, how far behind are you in the mortgage payments? Oh, well, how many times have you had to cut back and not pay people their salaries because things are too tight in the last year? Oh, you guys, KTDs, you don't need any more money. <laughs> That's how we think. That's not what God said. And that's not what Asa said. Asa said, okay, guys, things are pretty good now. We better build some walls. We better get ready because you never know when a battle is going to come and you never know what's going to happen down the road. And you don't take a time of peace and a time of rest and a time of no internal strife or division and just coast. Oh, no, no. That's the time to build something up. Your preacher said, we want to reach more people for Christ this year. Your preacher said, saying, we need to have a great offering and get down the dead. We need to go forward to that building. Did you know when that building's done, he's even got ideas about another building? Did you know he's got more ministries he wants to start and more people he wants to get involved in soul winning? He was telling me today about somebody that he took out and never been soul winning that long ago. The first visit and the last visit, they led somebody to Christ and the guy went home all excited. Did you know everybody in this church who's not a soul winner ought to become a soul winner and the preacher will help you to be a soul winner? You say, well, things are going good at Heritage Baptist. Man, God is blessing. Great. Build something then. Principle number two is it's best to build before the battle. Then, I want you to see what happened. He goes on to build, let us build these cities, verse 7, make about them walls, towers, gates, bars. While the land is before us, we sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and they prospered. And Asa had an army of men that bare targets and shears out of Judah, 300,000. Out of Benjamin that bare shields and drew bows, 204 score thousand. So altogether, 580,000 men in their army. These were mighty men of valor. I'm not sure that I can prove this, but it looks to me like that army has gone up quite a bit. If I go back to uh, Second Chronicles chapter 11, they had 180,000. They've got about three times that many now. He's building up. You say, well, how many soul winners do we need? Oh, everybody. Uh, I, I know you've won almost everybody in this area to Christ. I understand that San Francisco has now become a, a rather religious area because of your soul winning efforts. You think? And there's so many lost people in this area. Yeah, come on. And there's so many people who have no idea of the gospel. Yes, right. And they would get saved if somebody would tell them they, 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 they have no idea, they have no knowledge, they have no understanding. They're not going to find it from watching the news. They're not going to find it from reading the paper. They're not going to find it from listening to the politicians. They're going to find it because a soul winner knocks on the door and says, hey, I want you to know something. God loves you. Jesus died for you. In spite of the fact that you deserve to die and go to hell, God I want you to go to heaven. Somebody got to tell them that. And so he built himself an army. And then the Bible says, verse 9, there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with an host of a thousand thousand. You know how many that is? One million. He had how many? He had 580,000. He's almost outnumbered two to one. And 300 chariots. 
They came to Maresh, and Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephyr at Maresh. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing to thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. Here's the next lesson from the story. Battles are inevitable. You're aware in your state particularly, there have been legislative initiatives that would really have the idea of trying to control what your preacher preaches from this pulpit. There are people who believe it is hate speech to read the word of God. Just what the Bible says about marriage. That's what the Bible says about sodomy. To read that is hate speech. It is technically illegal to say what the Bible says in the land of Canada. And there are people who have been forbidden entrance in the land of Canada because they've taken a particular stand uh, that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. I believe it was your previous governor, a couple governors ago, or maybe the last governor, who famously said, I believe that gay marriage should only be between a man and a woman. He got a little confused, but what he said was right. <laughs> I don't know where the battle's going to come. I don't know whether it be some zoning ordinance that tries to shut you down, somebody that tries to withdraw the permission to park someplace, some new uh, uh, building code that's going to render your building to be far more expensive. I don't know what it's going to be. Somebody that tries to start a campaign on social media and spread all kind of lies and tell all kind of stories. Uh, I hope this isn't the case. I hope there's nobody in here. But, but sometimes somebody within the church gets a little disgruntled. Their kid didn't get the solo part in the Christmas program. Everybody else who helped with the dinner was mentioned publicly from the pulpit and their name was left off. And oh, they go around and they talk to this person and they talk to that person and they whisper to some other person, you listen to me. The Bible tells you, I mentioned this to the staff last year, the preacher reminded me of it. Uh, the Bible tells you what to do about people like that. It says, the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. And when somebody starts talking like that, you go, they won't talk too much. I don't know what the battle will be, but there will be a battle. There'll be a battle in your life. There'll be a battle in your family. There'll be a battle at your workplace. There'll be battles all the time that we have to fight. We won't want them. We don't invite them. We're not looking for them. But when they come, we better be like Asa and go out and meet them. And here's what we say. You know what, God? They're way bigger than us, but you're way bigger than them. Battles are inevitable, but God is invincible. Thou art our God. Do you know that uh, there's a movement to take away the tax-exempt status of churches in the United States? So that you would have to pay taxes not only on your profit, which isn't too bad. Most of us don't have much of that. But on your property. David Gibbs said if they succeed in that, he thinks 40% of the independent Baptist churches have to sell their property. Your property is worth millions of dollars. You've got a great location and beautiful buildings. And if you had to pay prevailing rate property taxes and you couldn't grandfather them in because you hadn't been paying them before, they'd do it on the current assessed value. It'd be a huge expense. Oh, you say, Brother Lutcher, making me nervous. What are we going to do? Have church. <laughs> the church went a long time without any buildings. <laughs> this is the place the church meets. This is not the church. You are the church. Lady walking down the sidewalk one Sunday, her Bible in her hand, her fancy clothes, go to meet and clothes on. And somebody said, ma'am, you going to church? And she said, no, sir, I'm the church going to happen. <laughs> no, they, they could take away our buildings. They can't shut down our church. You know, in the land of China, I'm told that when the communists took over and defeated Chiang Kai-shek, there were some three to four million Christians. And I'm told now that there are as many as 70, maybe even more million Christians. I'm told that in the next 15 years, China may be the most Christian nation in the world, not by percentage, but by number. And that's under a regime where many of the churches have to meet in secret and many of the preachers have been jailed in the past. And many of the Christians have to be very cautious about letting people know where they're going on Sunday. You can't stop the church of Jesus Christ. We don't need buildings. We don't need budgets. We don't need buses. We need God. Battles are inevitable. God is invincible. 
And the next lesson is this. I love this. Look at chapter 15. The Bible tells us that Asa was challenged. If you are with the Lord, he's with you. If you seek him, he'll be found. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you. And then look what happens. Verse 7. Be strong. Asa heard these words. Verse 8. He took courage and he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of all the cities which he had taken from Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. Now that's really interesting to me. Because he just said in verse 14, he got rid of all the idols. Or chapter 14. Now it's in chapter 15, he got rid of some more idols. I say, where'd they come from? Well, one, it says they'd taken some new cities. So some new cities had some old idols they had to get rid of. But I'll tell you something else. When we think we're perfect, we're not. My dad ran the Detroit Rescue Mission for 10 years, and they, as a part of their ministry, had a summer camping program for underprivileged kids from the inner city of Detroit. They would have... People from churches in the Detroit area counsel those kids. And I remember my dad meeting on the last day, the Saturday, and he had to clean up the camp. We rented it from a, it was a state campground facility. And he'd say, now sweep your cabins out. And when you're all done, sweep them again. And here's what he said. You'll be surprised how much dirt you get the second time. <laughs> well, preacher, we already had revival. Yeah, and the, you know what the problem means? You need revival. Well, I, I, the Lord's really done some great things in my life and, and I've stopped smoking and I don't listen to the wrong kind of music and I'm not watching nasty stuff on television. Boy, that's great. You said, what oh, I need next. So you probably need to be cleaned up some more. You know, in the Bible, there's sins of the flesh and sins of the spirit. In the story of the prodigal son, there wasn't a good son and a bad son. There were two bad sons. One son left his father's home. The other left his father's heart. One son wasted his substance and riotous living. The other son stayed home but did not share his father's spirit. And when his brother came back, he said, this thy son. And you're doing all this stuff for him. And he wasn't glad to see the prodigal come back. And I'm here to say that when the spirit of God begins to work at us, even if we've made tremendous progress, even if we've been growing a great deal, there's always some more cleanup to do. Brother Tommy Sexton told a story. He's great at working with rough converts, new converts in the world. And he always tells the people, you ought to please God. And uh, he had this man come to church and he was, he was smoking crack, cocaine. And uh, he said, preach what I do. He said, why don't you please God in that matter? Let's pray God will help you to please him about the matter of cocaine. So he stopped smoking crack. One day in Sunday school, this fairly new convert said, uh, I got a prayer request. He said, I watch NASCAR races on Saturday, and I'm trying to get down to where I only drink one case of beer during a NASCAR race. <laughs> Would you all pray with me that I'll just drink one case of beer during a NASCAR race? <laughs> now, what do you do when you have that prayer request in Sunday school? Brother Sexton very wisely said, well, let's pray with our brother that God will help him to please him in this matter of beer drinking during the NASCAR race. And the man said, I did that with the cocaine and give it up altogether. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what it's supposed to do with the booze too, don't you think? So there's more cleansing. And then look what happens. I love this. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin. That's his land. And, and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon. Wait a minute, those are tribes from the northern kingdom. These two kingdoms have separated. He's got people coming from Israel down to Judah. Why did they do that? For they fell to him out of Israel in abundance. When they saw that the Lord his God was with him. He had so many people going in the next chapter. The king of Israel tries to set up a Defense to keep from losing more of his people. Now here's the point I want you to see. Good people want to worship where God is working. Don't you worry about, well, you know, the progressive church, they have all these lights and people dance around and they have this music. It's kind of like a rock concert. Let me tell you something. Church ain't never going to be as good at rock and roll as the world is. 
You know what happens to those young people? They grow up in that church and they leave because they get them hooked on rock and roll, so they'd rather hear the good stuff instead of the stuff that the amateurs do in church. Contemporary church loses, by one study, 90-some percent of their young people. I heard Jim Baker on television say, we are losing over 80% of our young people. We may not keep 100%, but I guarantee we don't lose anywhere near that many. You know why? Because you can have all the lights and you can have all the showtime and you can have all the soft preaching and you can have all the clever psychological messages, but it doesn't change anybody's life. And what people are hungry for is a real God who will give real answers to the real problems in the lives of real people. And you just say, a church that prays down the power of God and sees lives changed and marriages put back together and young people restored to right relationship with their problems and people will want to be where God is at work. And the last thing I'll say is it's good to be excited about God. Look at verse 14 and all, verse 15 of chapter 15, excuse me. I'm sorry, verse 14. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath for they'd sworn with all their heart and they sought him with a whole desire and it was found to them and the Lord gave them rest round about. You know why you ought to say amen when your preacher's preaching? Well, because the Bible talks about it. And so you better speak in a language you understand so they can say amen at your giving of thanks. The word amen means so be it. It means I agree with that. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get somebody come in and they don't know anything and they're not saved. And your preacher is going to be preaching against, you know, drinking. And they're going to say, they don't believe in drinking here? Everybody I know drinks. This man's crazy. And all of a sudden he said, uh, ah, demon rum is ruined a bunch of lives. It'll ruin yours too. And everybody says, hey man. They say, oh, they're all crazy. Wow, he's not the only one. They agree with him. They're behind him. Uh, And you ought to be excited about the blessing of God. You are seeing God change people's lives. You're seeing God turn people from death into life and and from the power of darkness into the light of God himself. And you're seeing young people that want to go off and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to say, you ought to be excited about it. I think we have some pictures. Are they, did we get those? I emailed them. I don't know if we got them. Do you have any pictures? That's, the, that's a building in Durham, North Carolina. It was called the Council Christian Academy. You go ahead and show the next one. It was built in the early 1960s, largely by members of the Ku Klux Klan. You see, the government had decided that separate but equal whites going here and blacks going there was wrong. And they were right about that. Bible's real clear about racism. It just says, in Christ, there's neither Greek nor Jew. Barbarian nor Scythian, bond nor free, circumcision or uncircumcision, but Christ is all in and all. Doesn't matter where you came from or I came from. Doesn't matter how much melanin you have got in your skin or I got in my skin. It doesn't matter what our ancestry was. If you're saved and I'm saved, that what unites us in Jesus Christ is way bigger than any differences we have. Our church is part of a study in Rice University on multicultural churches. We didn't ask to be, they just came and talked to us. They came back and they said, we're different. I said, how are we different? They said, well, in the first place, you really are multicultural. And everybody else just says they are. (laughs) The second place they said, you do not have a social or political agenda. No, we have the Great Commission. You just go knock on the door. Whoever comes, you tell them about Jesus. Whoever gets saved, tell them to come to church and tell them to get baptized. And they become part of the church because they're already part of the family of God. But the KKK said, our kids ain't going to school. No black kids. And they weren't that nice. There's a flagpole outside the building. And the next picture shows the base of the flagpole. And on the base of the flagpole, if you look very carefully, the next picture Maybe I didn't send you that one. There it is. They wrote the word never. Never! Our kids aren't going to school with somebody of some other race. We'll build our own building. We'll have our private school. We will never, this building will never see black people and white people integrating. And uh, there'll be never any miscognition going on. We are going to maintain the purity of the white race. 
I want you to see the next picture. It's not called the Council Christian Academy anymore. It's owned by the Fellowship Baptist Church, pastored by Dr. Rick Finley. They redid the gym and they use it for their basketball teams. And they don't call it the Council Christian Academy. It's called Freedom Hall. And 15 or so percent of their school are of African-American descent. And two of our young ladies teach on their staff after graduating from West Coast Baptist College. That's a great story. I love it. But you know what I love more? I love more the story that this world fell into sin because of the temptation of Satan. And sin, death passed upon all men for the all of sin. By one man, sin entered into the world and all of us became sinners and the devil had his hooks on us and the devil had us set to an eternal damnation and the devil said, I'm going to hang on to them and they'll never escape my clutches. But one day, a redeemer came. Jesus Christ came, was born of a virgin, lived flawlessly, sinlessly for 33 years on this world, allowed wicked men to nail him to a cross where he shed his blood as the perfect atonement for our sin was buried in a borrowed tomb and rose from the grave the third day. And everybody who believes on Jesus is delivered from the devil and they have freedom in Jesus Christ. Glory to God. I think you could get excited about that. Lord, thanks for the story of Asa. Thanks for the privilege we have to be your children. Thanks, Lord, that if we seek you, we can find you. As long as we're with you, you'll be with us. We know you'll never leave us or forsake us, but we know we turn from you. The Bible tells us that you're not far from every one of us. That if we will turn towards you. We can be reunited, reunited with you again. Draw an eye to God, you've said, and you told us you would draw an eye to us. Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to see the things that ought to be cleansed. Help us, Father, to be willing to be part of the building and the strengthening when things are at peace. And help us, Heavenly Father, to really, because the battles, though inevitable, are conducted on our behalf by our invincible God, to be excited about what you're doing. May there be such a spirit of wonderful encouragement and optimism about what you're doing in this place that people from all around are attracted to it. And work in our hearts about what you want us to do because of what you've told us tonight. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. Some people are already praying at the altar. I wonder who says, you know what, Brother Willett, I need to put in practice some things that I heard about tonight. Maybe some things need to be cleansed. Maybe I need to seek the Lord and make him a bigger priority in my life. Maybe I need to be more of a part of the building that's going on at this church. Everything's good now. Land is at rest. God's given us peace, but we know there are battles down the road. And maybe, maybe I need to just remember in my time of battle that I... I may have an inevitable battle, but I have an invincible God. You say, brother, well, that God's dealt with me. I ought to do some business with him tonight. Pray for me. If you say that, hold your hand up high. God bless you. Father, bless each one and help us to act in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. The music plays. Would you stand to your feet? Has bowed and eyes closed, please. Spirit of God has spoken in your heart. I invite you to come. Find a place at the altar to do business with God. Don't hesitate. Don't wait for anybody else. Just act in obedience as God's Spirit speaks.
Well, our Father, thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for loving us. Help us to be faithful servants. Thank you for this tremendous church. Bless my dear friend, Dr. Fong, as he leads this great congregation. And make this a tremendous year of seeing people saved, seeing the building go up, seeing the debt go down, and seeing your word go forth in a great way in this community and all around the world. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being part of your family and part of this particular service area, this particular work of yours, this local church that is having such a great impact on this area and on the world, and help us to be strong in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you so much for letting me come. Do you remember that stuff I talked to you about last night? Do you remember that? Then I don't have to say anything about it tonight, right? Okay. Uh, uh, most of us still there. I only have one copy left of the book when you can't just get over it. If I run out of anything you'd like, I will send it to you in the mail if you'll pay the special price that I mentioned last night. And uh, uh, I think just a couple other things about most of us there. I hope you'll get it. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. I also don't want to have to carry it back on the airplane <laughs> because it'll be heavy. And I don't get back till 5.30 and I got prayer meeting at 7 o'clock and choir practice at 6.53. And, and I don't get to check any bags because of that. So I got to lift that thing up and put it in the overhead bin. And if you make me bring all that stuff in there, I'll probably rupture a disc. <laughs> Mind up getting crippled. Not be able to go out and preach anymore and it'll be your fault. <laughs> but just, just do whatever the Lord leads you to do about purchasing the material. You do remember my special deal, right? Remember my special deal? Remember, because you have to be careful these days. Money's a little tight some places. So if you get anything from my table, and at any time you feel like it was a poor investment, you're disappointed, uh, you just call me up. I don't care how long you've had it. I don't care what kind of shape it's in. You just call me up, and I promise I will immediately tell you how very sorry I am. <laughs> <laughs>